to the Oxford Brooks Biomedical Science podcast. I'm Ben and I'm here today with Caitlin and Theodora and we'll be interviewing Andrew Jones who is a lecturer at Oxford Brooks University and he studies molecular biology. So welcome Andrew and thank you for joining us. Well thank you very much for inviting me, it's great. So we'll start off with the question just about how you sort of first became a molecular biologist. So I was wondering, you know, what sort of interest you, interested you in the field and got you inspired to study it? So I think if we go back into the mists of time, I think it probably started when, you know, at school or when you're, mid, you know, when you're small, everyone had that fascination with dinosaurs. There's dinosaurs all over the place. And I think I never grew out of that. And so I think from you know, middle school, secondary school, maybe even university, I still have that sort of fascination with dinosaurs. But I think what that was, it got me interested in just nature. And, and, and in turn, that got me interested in biology. And then I guess at A-levels, I did biology, chemistry, and then I thought, okay, I'm gonna do a biochemistry degree. And then my year abroad, that placement year, um, was when I really got into molecular biology. So, you know, doing all the classics like, you know, PCR and, and DNA cloning and looking at sequencing. And I think that's what really got me interested. And I think all things molecular biology, I just, I just love that. And, you know, getting in the lab and just using a pipette uh, and stuff like that. So I think that's probably what has kind of got me in that direction, really, in terms of- so using Would you say it's like the, ha the hands-on side of it you very much find uh, interesting? Yeah, very much so. I think it's very much, you know, getting in the lab, getting, using the pipettes, um, using those little, you know, sort of Eppendorf tubes. And even though you can't see the DNA and all of this, getting those results, you know, looking at a gel and all of that and figuring out what it all means. And then, you know, looking at all the strings of letters and stuff. I think all of that, the lab plus what you get at the end, I think sort of what I find really exciting. So leading on from like your academic studies and things like that, what actually kind of drew you to become a lecturer at Brooks? So I think, um, so, I mean, I, I guess I kind of did the classic sort of route, I think, in terms of getting to the lectureship. So it was doing that undergraduate degree, um, which was at Imperial College London. So I did a biochemistry degree. Then I went on to do a PhD, which was at um, the University of Leeds. Um, and then, and then really, I think at those stages, I, was, I wasn't really thinking, oh, I want to become a lecturer. It's basically more like, oh, I want to do research and things like that. Uh, and then when you do a PhD after that, if you want to carry on research, sort of the next logical thing is, is to do what's known as a postdoc, so postdoctoral sort of work, uh, work. And I think I basically did that for, for 10 years. And then during that time, you do a little bit of teaching, mostly of demonstrating, um, also supervising students that come into the lab. And that's something that I quite enjoyed as well. And I think when it's, it's sort of, the, I did about 10 years of that postdoc um, and sort of, yeah, then I started looking into, you know, into a lectureship position, which is more like a long-term sort of permanent job as it were, a long-term job where you can do research, but also you have the, the teaching side. And that's something I also wanted to do as well. And because I was at Oxford, so I was actually doing my postdoc at the University of Oxford, you know, I had a family I sort of settled down um, that, that I, you know, that I wanted to actually stay in Oxford. I also had some collaborations with, uh, so, uh, with somebody at Oxford Brooks, or I had help from Oxford Brooks, and that was Isabel. So I kind of knew her before I came to Oxford Brooks. So that's how I got more into knowing more about Oxford Brooks University. And um, yeah, and that's why I was interested in sort of, sort of actually working there. All right. Um, going on from from that, you said that you did a lot of research, you know, with doctoral and postdoc. Um, could you tell us a little about? Um, could you tell us a little bit about your research in the pesticide resistance of mosquitoes? Okay. So I guess, in some ways, I'm kind of lucky in that a lot of almost from the PhD up to the mosquito work, it was kind of in the same field in that um, I'm working on really um, a group of receptors. So you can kind of think of them as brain receptors. Um, so these are like 
you may have heard this, like nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, GABA receptors, and so forth. Um, and these happen in insects. They happen to be targets, the molecular targets of a lot of insecticides. So the classic one, well, the one that's probably most well known at the moment is probably neonicotinoids, but quite a lot of others as well. Um, and so I study quite a lot of aspects of how these receptors work. But one of the aspects that I look at is how mutations in these receptors can cause them to become less sensitive to the insecticide. So that means insecticide would normally bind to these receptors, which would then interfere with, let's say, nervous system signaling. But when, when you've got a mutation, um, the insecticide can't bind so well to the receptor and therefore you get resistance. The, the, the insect becomes less sensitive. And so one, one of the things, um, obviously, I was, one of the things I was looking at was actually mosquitoes and because I had the biomedical side of interest is, as, you, as you well know, I sort of teach in that area in the brooks. So obviously, you know, the biomedical side being things like malaria, dengue fever and so forth. And a lot of the time, the way that we control these diseases is, is by hitting the mosquito vector itself. And, you know, a few decades ago, we put, we thought, oh, we've got this nailed. We just chucked DDT on these mosquitoes and that will stop malaria. And, and that didn't work. I mean, one of the reasons is DDT is not very nice anyway, but the fact is that mosquitoes became resistant. And, and so this resistance makes it much harder to control um, these diseases. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm looking into just looking into what, you know, the, the reasons why um, it, they become resistant. So that's like mutations. So point mutations in the DNA changes the receptor function and structure. So um, the insecticides can't bind. And so, um, so the, the, the sort of the present sort of project that I'm doing at the moment, which is looking at insecticide resistance in mosquitoes, actually came about from a holiday. So I went on holiday to Laos. It was a family holiday. I was visiting somebody in Laos and um, I got speaking to somebody at the Pasteur Institute in Laos. They kind of read a couple of papers I did. Um, and it kind of just came about of like, I said, well, why don't you send me some mosquitoes? You go around, you know, because that's what you do, kind of collect the mosquitoes and look at them. And if you send them over and I can have, you know, people at Brooks just look at them and see, are there any mutations that give rise to, to resistance? Um, and so I thought it was a nice, a nice sort of research that was driven by the project, the undergrad project, um, and, make, and that, in a way that made it possible. So I think that was, that was a nice way of sort of getting into that field. And, and, and I think, you know, I think with COVID, I think we all know mutations is a big thing, right? And, and I think also, so it's the same with this, this research, just monitoring resistance mutations in different populations of mosquitoes and saying whether, okay, you're resistant to this insecticide, don't use this insecticide anymore because that just make it worse. Try something else, you know, do something else. Or you don't have any mutations. You seem okay at the moment. Um, you're not that resistant. So at the moment, it's okay to carry on using um, the insecticide. But obviously, you've got to keep monitoring. You've got to keep surveying all these um, um, mosquitoes because over time, when you start chucking on the same insecticide, they will become eventually resistant. And that means, you know, controlling those diseases is going to get harder. Um, and so, so that's why I kind of like, that's one sort of area of the research. And I kind of like, it's very topical, got that immediate sort of obvious relevance as well, I think, um, which is quite nice to it. So yeah, there's obviously, mm -hmm. you can sort of see the results in there and the impact they have with uh, the malaria in Laos, for example. I mean, you know, you can tell them, you get the real world uh, sort of impact of that, which is obviously good. Um, so how much of like your work has actually led to changes in like the pesticides being used? Has it had a big impact, you think? So it hasn't, so it's, it's kind of, in a way it's a bit early days so far. So we've had, um, We've had one publication um, arising from the project students, and that's, that was actually showing that there was a lack of mutations against another insecticide. So, um, so basically saying, right, at the moment, there, are, there are, aren't many mutations in this, so it's okay to carry on using this particular insecticide. 
Now we're going, we're looking at a different internet provider. So this second slide I'm looking at at the moment is something called pyrethroid, which is very, very widely used. Um, you'll find it in you know, land killer and home base or whatever. And we're finding there's evidence now of there's quite a lot of mutations. It's very rare for mosquitoes to not have mutations to these, um, uh, you know, to, so that's resistant to these pyrethroids. So hopefully with this evidence that we're showing now, and hopefully that will build into maybe the next several years of us saying and recommending, look, resistance is starting to snowball here. It's, it's evident, it's probably gonna get worse. You should, you should start looking into, into using different measures and that could be different insecticides or different ways of trying to control um, the mosquitoes. So hopefully, um, you know, hopefully in the next few years there, there will be an impact there. Okay. Um, I just wanted to ask, I know that that's, you say that you, it's driven by the undergrad, um, like project students. What kind of work do they do with you on this? Because I remember when we were applying for our projects, you were one of like, you're quite sought after, I know that much, amongst the students to work with you and on this project, because it's um, like such a real world application. Um, so what's like one of the key things that the undergrads work on? Um, just for, for future people applying and they're wondering about what kind of thing they'll do. Uh, so, so, so yes, yeah, so what, basically what they will do is they'll do a lot of um, um, sort of classic microbiology. So we get the mosquitoes sent from different regions of Laos and actually we've got some from Cambodia now. So the studies are kind of progressing to other places in Southeast Asia, which is quite exciting, but basically they, these mosquitoes get collected in Laos or Cambodia and you know these are collected we know the GPS coordinates uh, of where these mosquitoes are collected we know where the villages are and the city are so we can hopefully map where these mutations and resistance is in different parts of, of the country so they, they, they're sent over the mosquitoes are actually sent over to to Oxford Brooks um, so they're all dead all in little tubes and what the students will do is they'll take individual mosquitoes and they'll sort of mash and crush them up and then extract the DNA from these mosquitoes. Um, and then they'll do, um, it's probably what you know is, is something called PCR, which is that they will, they will basically amplify some DNA, um, some of that genomic DNA. And then they'll basically um, do all the, the, the classic procedures of either PCR, you do agrose gel electrophoresis, you then purify the PCR DNA, so then you can get that DNA sent off to a company um, that then sequences for you. So what you actually end up doing is you extract DNA from mosquito, send off to a company, analyze the sequence, and you look at the sequence to see are there any differences in that sequence, um, which could be insecticide resistant mutations. So it's kind of putting, I think, all the stuff that, you know, you, all the good stuff you learned probably in molecular biology and genetics, um, and actually really getting in the lab. And what's really nice is that almost from the word go, the students, I tell, I show the students how to do the DNX, the PCR and so forth. And it's like, right, off you go, analyze as many mosquitoes as you can. And they, they get into that groove really quickly, get independent really quickly. And by the end, you know, four or five weeks later, they're just masters of organizing gel electrophoresis of PCRs and analyzing the sequences. And, you know, as you mentioned, it does have that kind of real world impact. So it's almost like as we go along, we get the DNA analyzed. So it's almost like we see mutations coming in. And it's like, oh, this village seems to have a hotspot of mutations, whereas this one doesn't. And, and that's as you're doing the project. And I think it's quite exciting as well. Um, and, and sort of, you know, in the, in the last year was like, OK, looks like we've got a lot of mutations here. And we're hoping to write that up to say, look, in the house, um, yeah, it, pirate, you carry on using these insecticides is probably not a good idea. It's just, just going to make things worse. Um, yeah, and it's great. I think I think I think they have a fun time. We work; they work as a group. Um, all their results get put together, get combined together to paint a bigger picture of what's happening. Um, but I think it's all exciting. Yeah. Wow. Oh, okay. Um, so continuing on from that. 
Um, do you have any advice for those that are interested in studying molecular biology or doing postgraduate research in, in general? Um, so I think I think the, the first thing first is hopefully, and certainly when you're going into postgraduate research, and that could be molecular biology, it could be biochemistry, or you know, or bioinformatics, or anything like that. Um, you've got to have that intrinsic interest. Okay, there's got to be something inside you that makes you want to just jump out of bed in the morning, go into the lab, or get onto the computer and, and just analyze, do stuff. All right. Uh, so that's got to be there um, because it's you PhDs it's usually it's not nine to five yeah I think your brain will not switch off from thinking oh yeah I could do this I could do that you you know you just want to get in and do that so first of all I think you've got to have that sort of drive um, and then I think uh, and probably what I would say um, uh, to students who you know who want to go on to do do postgraduate studies is get as much extra experience as you can so obviously you know you've, you've done the project um and maybe done things like you know, the mega practical and microbiology or other things but try and get extra stuff um and whether that could be i mean the placement is an obvious thing um but maybe just trying to get to do some extra you know several weeks work in somebody's lab it doesn't matter where it is it's just that extra experience because i think Nowadays, when, when people are applying for PhDs, I think that you know, the people who are recruiting are, look, are sometimes looking for those extra things to, it makes you stand out, it makes you more competitive. Um, and I think having that, or maybe a master's um, as well, um, increases your chances in getting um, a PhD. So I think, I think so my advice to you, anyone is, is to yes, just get as much extra experience you can, whether it's you find it voluntarily or um, you know year extra in terms of placement MSc um, because I think that's that's kind of how it is nowadays in, in terms of trying you know getting a PhD afterwards but um, but as I said it's got to be you've got to want to do it something that just excites it naturally excites you it's just that and hopefully you know you know and you as students you'll get have, get that feeling when you do your project and think okay this is for me or it's not for me that that buzz of finding things out and wanting to find out more. Um, I think that's what you initially got to have to start with. That's, that's honestly, it's amazing, like the drive that you have to do what you're doing. Um, and I think all your research is amazing that you've done. Um, the last question we're gonna ask you is, if you could invite any person to dinner um dead or alive who would it be and why oh my god okay i mean that there are so many people um i but i think i think if i had to choose i think it'd be david attenborough um i think he's a legend he's an absolute legend i think he has done so much in his life um you know in terms of all the, all the stuff with bbc but you know just exploring you know different parts of the world and we didn't really know much about the world and bringing that back to us um and yeah when i was a kid when when i was 10 and 11 um i was just blown away by his program so i, I mean support this is way before your time but he did a series i think called the life on earth and the living planet and that and that in a way got me interested in, in biology as well um you know, plus he did show dinosaurs, so that helped. But you know, the fact that you know that, that uh, and I think some in some in some funny way, I think I probably owe something to him. You know, me being where it, you know I am now. And I think what's really interesting is is seeing my kids when they are were ten and eleven, just seeing David Attenborough and, and similarly getting blown away by it. You know, so it's just this all generations I think have seen. Uh, you know. You know what, what he's like and what he can do and, and I think he's you know whether it's a serious chat show or something like Graham Norton he can somehow make nature and life just interesting to whatever kind of audience is watching it at the time and I think I think he'll be so fascinating I think to have a dinner but I don't think there'll be any dull moments I have so many stories um to say 
So I think I would have to say, um, yeah, David Attenborough. He has been so popular um, with everyone that we've interviewed. Most uh, people have said is David is Attenborough. I mean, a yeah. true legend. He is. He's just um, an absolute legend. And um, and I think, has, has, he, has he come up before? Is it as several times? So I will say somebody else because I'll, I'll mix it. I'll mix it. Together. I'll say something <laughs> different. Um, and, um, and I will say the other person, it can happen at the same time. I wonder if it would be quite interesting. The other person I would invite is um, Christopher Lee. Do you know Christopher Lee? So, all right. So he he was um, so you in your generation he would be um, Count Dooku or Sauron from the Lord of the Rings. But he was in a lot of things like the Hammer Horror, which was Dracula and stuff like this. He has been in so many so many films. And again, I think he would be kind. He's a he, I mean, you know, he's passed away now, but he he's a legend as well in, in the film industry. So. Um, so I think having him, his experiences, and so many genres of films, I think would be really fascinating as well. I don't think it'd be a dull story of him. And I think having him plus David Attenborough, I think, would, would be wow. a very interesting dinner dinner party. So yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. That uh, was a very interesting uh, talk, and I think that would be a very interesting dinner party as well. <laughs> yeah. No, I um, want that to happen now. Now you've mentioned it. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for joining us. And um, hope everyone listening at home enjoyed it. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.